For those of you who are following along at home, thank you for joining in the conversation via Twitter. Um, I'm love seeing, loving seeing all the home office setups and the different ways that you're watching us. Make sure and keep the conversation going. Our second session of the day and our first mini session is called There's No Place Like SGF. Um, and I'm really excited about this one because I know why I'm in Springfield and I know why many of you are in Springfield is because we all have this belief that we can build the life we dream of right here in Springfield. And so we're going to spend the next few minutes meeting with a number of YPs who are doing just that. First off, we're going to kick things off with Brandy Harris, our reigning Captain Springfield, uh, with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Springfield. Ryan, Ryan, can I get that clicker? Thank you. Just you want this. Hi. <laughs> so happy to be in front of people. Okay. People ask me all the time why I decided to stay in Springfield. That town that puts tree nuts on its chicken, large fish shops and restaurants on every corner, with painted horses on the back of a movie theater, high school rivalries and mask mandates, with high poverty and unemployment rates. Why didn't you take that job in Atlanta or Kansas City? Don't you know that the mountains in Denver are really pretty? You could work for a different boys and girls club and make a lot more money. Are you sure the Ozarks is for you, honey? On August 5th, 1986, the world stood still. A baby was born. <laughs> she moved all around the country, year after year, would try to make a friend and then would have to disappear. She had to teach herself how to read. She lived in survival mode. She was a failure. Everyone agreed. People in and out of her life every single day, abuse, neglect, she could never get away or just be a kid and play. But then one day, she ended up here in Springfield, Missouri. 13 different schools before moving here in 99 became a Reed Beaver, the most awkward mascot of all time. <laughs> it was the first time a teacher asked her how she felt. It was the first time someone truly saw her. It was the first time she was given the opportunity to set and accomplish goals. It was the first time that she started to feel whole, no longer broken and sad. People made sure she didn't go hungry and that she had clothes and running water. People laughed at her jokes and she was treated like someone's daughter. People coached her and supported her, made sure she didn't feel abused, neglected, poor, and dejected. Coach Gordon cheered her on as she played basketball. Miss Bruner said hello every time she was in the hall. Miss Frederick made her a teacher's aide. Miss Hostler counselor, counseled her and told her that she was made for something bigger than herself. Dr. Leaf made her smile. Mr. Bruton coached her on how to go the extra mile. Coach Fielding taught her how to be a team player. And Mr. Hudson said, you know, Brandy, one day you could be mayor. Her guard started to come down. She frowned a lot less. She developed leadership skills and learned the difference between no and yes. She was the first in her family to attend college. She was a panther and then a bear. She believed she could do anything and go anywhere. And out of all the places in all the world, she decided to live and stay in Springfield, Missouri. People ask me all the time why I decided to stay in Springfield. Why do I stay in Springfield? Because it is a town that puts tree on its chicken. It is a town that when someone references a fork in the road, they actually mean a fork in the road. It is a town that ends up on a lot of lists, some great, some not. How many nonprofits does it have? A lot. It's a town that comes together to help people. A town on March 19th, when I asked for help, they provided masks, money, and food for people who needed it. You see, this place is more than just a city. It is a heartbeat that helps keep people alive. A town that values sustainability and altruism. A town that is slowly but surely reaching its potential. A town with poverty, but hope. A town with prejudice, but potential. A town with racism and hate, but a love that is stronger than the mountains we move to build it. Why do I stay in Springfield? Because people always say things like, well, I wish Springfield had this, or I wish Springfield had that, or I wish they changed this, or I wish they changed that. These things do not happen on their own. It takes people 
who work and people who are ready to work. It takes passion, resilience, and a desire to make sure that everyone in this entire community feels safe, valued, and important. To ensure that the lines between North and South start to disappear, that we have open hearts and listening ears, that we have the potential to open the door, and that we are the ones we've been waiting for. Why do I stay in Springfield? Because there are 25,000 kids in this community who need an adult who's over the moon for them. There are 2,500 kids who walk through the Boys and Girls Club blue doors every single day that need a safe space to learn, grow, and to just be a kid. You see, this place is more than just a city. It is a heartbeat that helps keep people alive. Why do I stay in Springfield? Because it is a town with a stellar cost of living that helps feed people in need on Thanksgiving, a town with churches galore and 34 Walmarts, a town that values small business, health, and the arts. It's a town that will deliver you drinks and, gr and grub, and it is home to the best place on earth, the Boys and Girls Club. Why do I stay in Springfield? Because this town and the people in it built me equipped me with what I needed to become who I am today and literally saved my life. You see, this place is more than just a city. It is a heartbeat that helps keep people alive. And for as long as I am capable, I will pour my heart back into the very city that helped remind me that I am not my circumstance or my experience, that I am not destined to become a statistic that I read about in books, and that I have the potential to make the world a little bit better than when I entered it. Why do I stay in Springfield? Why not? Thank you. It's hard to beat that, right? Like, thanks, Brandy. Thank, thank you for all you do uh, for all the kids in Springfield and for Springfield as a whole. Next up, we have Sean, the incredibly talented Sean Monday. everybody doing out there? <clears throat> Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Folks at home, hello. You could not hear the thunderous applause. Oh, look at that guy. There's a monitor down here. All right. This got real good. Um, you could not hear the thunderous applause, folks at home, but I assure you it was there as I'm very important and very famous. So just, just you can clap at home if you want. They've got room for applause on here on this script too. All right. I don't have a script. There's nothing on these note cards either. They're a prop. I'm like carrot top in that way, if you guys. I'm actually a musician, though. Um, so, you know, just as funny. Uh, what do you guys think of my jacket also? Let's get that out of the way. There we go. Come on, stop. Uh, hello, my name is Sean Monday. Let's get this going. Five minutes on the clock starting. Now, here we go, let's get it going. Uh, let's see, I was born at a very young age, right? Um, okay, uh, just checking. Then some stuff happened, I grew up and I moved uh, to Boston, Massachusetts. Um, anybody familiar with Boston, Massachusetts? Anybody familiar, no? We got a couple, okay. It's on a map, check it out, Google. Um, a lot of good sports teams there. So I, uh, I went there, I went there for school, really just to live, and I went there a couple years before uh, school, college, to study music. Uh, lived, worked, played, did all that stuff, loved, lost, um, life. And after I graduated from school, I got a job in the music uh, education and technology field, which is what my uh, degree was in which was great. So I got to play music all the time. I got to work in the, in the studios. I got to, to travel. I was uh, teaching as well. But what that all amounted to was about 14 to 16 hour workdays, about six days a week on average, right? 
which is fine. I'm doing what I like, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. And one day I was uh, late January, I remember, I was traipsing through that disgusting late January New England snow on my way to a gig, right? That kind of snow, it's about up here at that time, so it gets into your, your shoes and your socks and you just have to deal with it for that quarter mile you have between the, the subway or the bus stop and your job. And I was thinking to myself, is this the best uh, I can be doing? What, what is my ROI on all of this? Not, not just the money, which is important, but what, what, what am I getting back for my investment of my time? right? 14 to 16 hours a day, six days a week. What am I getting back? The money part is, is, a, is a big incentive, and it's very obvious. If you're not familiar with the disparity in terms of how far money goes between a New England uh, area, Boston, New York, versus here, um, at that time, it kind of goes like this. You can get a very nice, um, let's say, studio apartment slash closet, right? for a certain amount, that same amount, you can come here and get three bed, two bath, full kitchen, yard. Come on. So the writing was on the wall as far as, you know, that, that aspect of it. But I needed a couple more things, right? I needed, buy, I needed a good airport because I still wanted to travel. Check. So that's awesome. And then I needed the reason... Uh, the thing that is the reason why I stayed, which I think is much more uh, important than why I left, which I think is super obvious. Um, it's, it's the things like we have uh, right here today. I get to travel all, all across the country and I get to work with a lot of different people and a lot of different kind of arrangements and I experience a lot of different, uh, different areas, different towns, and how they operate, and it's really cool. And it's a lot of fun, I get to learn a lot. One of the things that struck me when I moved here, uh, a couple years after I moved here, is that there is, there is something unique to this area that a lot of other areas that might be comparable can't really touch. And that is there is an undercurrent of very talented, very enthusiastic, very energized people doing things, creating, collaborating, desiring to make their community and the world as a whole a better place. And it's one thing to say that, but they mean it. And it's one thing to mean it, but it's another thing to have the tools and the ability and the talent to back it up. And that's what I found here. One of the things that I was uh, struck by, especially these last couple years, is events like this, organizations like the network, places like the E-Factory, that there are similar groups and entities in, in other towns. They are there. But you want more than just there, right? Places like the network, places like the E-Factory, the things that the Chamber are doing, the things that some of our government locally are doing, they're more than just there, they care. And that's what you want if you are trying to grow a business, if you're trying to operate a startup, if you're trying to do more for yourself and for your community, if you're trying to grow in those same ways. That's what you want and that's what I found here. You guys agree? No? Yeah? Whatever. I'm having a great time. <laughs> so that's why I chose to be here, and I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, happy and thankful and very appreciative of, of so many of, of you guys and uh, your efforts. Um, a lot of people, um, I don't want to say a lot, I'll say my, my circle of friends, I remember when I said, guys, <laughs> I'm done with that. <laughs> I'm done with this. The snow and the, the, the traffic and the, the people and, and the honking and all this stuff. I'm all set on that. I am out of here. I said, where are you going? Are you going to L.A., man? I said, no. Are you going to, uh, I don't know where else there is, New York? Are you going to New York for good, man? I said, no, I'm going to uh, Missouri. Where's that? 
It's right, right in the middle of the country there. Oh, like uh, uh, St. Louis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 I don't want to go to St. Louis. It's a couple, couple hours um, south of that. What's a couple hours south of St. Louis? A little town called Springfield. Oh, like the Simpsons. So, yeah, like the Simpsons. Yeah, yeah. And they thought it was crazy and say, hey, good luck. Uh, but I bet on myself, and it paid off, right? Um, those people that said that, they're not doing music anymore. They had to abandon those dreams and those goals because it wasn't sustainable how they were doing it. I bet on myself, and it paid off. A couple years ago, uh, I pretty much quit everything else I was doing and went into business for myself, People said, that's crazy. You can't quit all your jobs and just do your thing. That's, that's not, that's not uh, wise. This is, yeah, I'll be fine. I bet on myself when it paid off. So what I am asking you guys to do is to bet on yourselves for the betterment of this community, really for the betterment of this world. Bet on yourselves. Bet on Springfield, Missouri. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. It's pretty easy to get behind a community that cares so much and bet, and bet on that. Next up, we've got Zach Troutman with Follow the Leader. I don't need it. She said you don't need it. Good afternoon. Um, before I get started, I just want to send some love back home to South Florida to my sister and uh, my beautiful niece who just had brain surgery and is in a coma, but we got some positive signs this morning. So, honesty, Uncle Zach loves you. <clears throat> so, I'm supposed to be talking about, you know, how, how I'm living my dream in Springfield. Obviously, I just told you guys I'm from Florida. so. How much of a dream could I be living not being in Florida? Um, as I was thinking about what I was going to share with you guys, I, I honestly thought about the nightmare that, uh, you know, kind of kind of fueled my passion and, and kind of woke my spirit up uh, to, to realize what, what God can do through me. Um, March 18, 2015, I got a call that forever changed my life. Um, my best friend, Adam Hall, had, uh, had died by suicide. And uh, it's just one of those things that, uh, excuse me, it's one of those things that you, you see on social media um, and you, you feel bad and you send positive vibes and prayers. But it's just one of those things that's just never happened to me. I spent a, a long time, a couple years, extremely depressed, um, unattached, unmotivated, just sad, angry, confused. Um, I just was an un, unintentional soul just roaming the earth. And uh, those things combined don't make you a good person um, or, or a leader. And I, I remember sitting there. Um, I was actually watching my kids play and just kind of figuring out, you know, what, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, I can't, I can't live like this. And uh, just sitting there watching my kids, I was praying, and God made it very clear that going back to South Florida was not in the plans. And uh, at that point, I mean, I have a lot of great people around me, a lot of, spent a lot of time in prayer just trying to figure out how I can... Um, you know, plant my seeds here and make an impact. And God made it clear that you're not going back home to impact the community that raised you. You need to impact the community that's raising your two sons. And uh, that's how Follow the Leader was started. And, uh, you know, our mission is to support people who are struggling and return to their personal best and just recognize their value. Um, my dream is to, to create spaces where men, um, and young people can come and and talk about the mental health and, and talk about the things that they struggle with and the things that are difficult. Uh, my grandma raised me to uh, to be the type of leader that starts leading in the home first, 
and then your community. So I know it's very important for me to raise my sons and show them what vulnerability look like, transparency, and uh, teaching them that as young boys, it's okay to say you don't know something, um, you need help, um, you're frustrated. And so trying to navigate that within my own self, but also my two sons and um, it was uh, it was it was just one of those things that just came together organically. Um, I've I've met a lot of people being open and, and transparent myself. I've met a lot of great people here in Springfield that have helped push my mission out and got me in front of some some of the very people that I feel God's put me here to 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 help. Um, I just encourage any of you young professionals, anyone out there, I mean, there's no, I mean, your dreams, there's nothing, um, there's nothing too small. I see Springfield being a, a more diverse community um, and, and, and something deeper than the color of our skin, our life experiences, our, the, how we think, how we process. Um, I, I think this is gonna be a beautiful place. I'm, I'm very excited uh, to raise my boys here. Um, you know, I'll leave you guys with this, uh, that you wake up every day and uh, you have a choice to, to go live your dream or you can go live the dream that someone else wants for you. Um, don't look back and, and regret that because time is something we don't get back. And so I, I just want to encourage you all to wake up and, and figure it out. And uh, I tell a lot of people, man, if you focus on impact and not income, eventually the, end, the income will, will come. And so together, I think we can make this community a better place. If there's uh, anything that I could do, uh, just get, we can get connected and get started. So thank you all for your time. Zach, thanks so much. Springfield is, is a better place because you and, you and your family are here. Next up, we have Meg Wagler, a vi visual artist and activist. Come on out, Meg. Hi, am I on? I am. Hi, everybody. So I'm Meg Wagler, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about an organization I started called Mid by Midwest. So it obviously has a namesake that probably sounds familiar. I'm sure you see where I'm going with it, but indulge me while I talk a little bit about where we are and where I think we can get. So a quick background on me. Um, I came here in 2007. I'm from St. Louis. Came down to art school, uh, started my career here as a designer art director, bounced around from a few different companies and agencies, and ultimately decided agency life wasn't for me. So I wanted to stretch my legs as an independent artist and have been doing that since. So in making that career transition, I started to notice a few holes in our art ecosystem, and I thought I could fill them. So I started digging around and uh, dove into the public sector a little bit, did some conversational uh, art, <laughs> and ultimately decided, um, I, well, I had some clarity on how to move forward. So I went ahead and established this organization, Mid by Midwest, with the focus being as an arts and culture organization, focus on the culture. So if we are focused on that, then we'll be diversifying Springfield's culture, our talent, and our veneer. So where that's important is that we're not just bringing in art for the sake of bringing in art, right? That is important, aesthetics do matter, but we really need to address the infrastructure, right? The diversity behind our talent pool and, and why it is what it is now and how we can sort of make strides to move forward in the future. So if we focus on that, we start to wrap our public arts into the conversation of what we're talking about with the Forward SGF initiative, right? When we hear talks about placemaking and, and pride of place and, and feeling um, excited about where you live, right? Some of that we know wraps in uh, to, to the arts, right? So one of the things that Mid by Midwest really wants to focus on is how we can create accessibility to that art. So when you have galleries uh, that, that are showcasing art, that's a really wonderful thing, but sometimes that prevents folks from coming in, right? Whether that be for 
um, financial reasons or cultural reasons. They may not feel comfortable. They may not feel dressed well. Uh, and so what's so special about public art is that you're able to remove those boundaries and truly wrap the arts into that conversation of diversity and inclusive inclusivity as we move forward as a city. So it's a pretty lofty goal, right? <laughs> so over time, we have a pretty big goal of uh, starting a residency program here focused on public arts. But to get there, you kind of have to show some proof in the pudding that Springfield is here and ready to, to really prove some value and put value on the arts. And so I have a plan. So before we get there, our year one focus is on hosting Springfield's first mural festival here in downtown Springfield. So we'll talk a little bit about that, if I can. Got it. OK, so we're set to host our first festival. We were going to do it this year, but COVID struck. And we wanted to take uh, public safety really seriously for, for our community and also for our artists. So we pushed it to next year. So we're set to host our first festival in September of 2021. We're really excited. We went ahead and we've already curated uh, eight artists. And so that's a mix of local, regional, and national talent. Um, and by doing that and diversifying the pool, we can really get a really broad range of styles, a range of cultural backgrounds and artistic endeavors. So we're excited about that. And I'll show you a slide here in a second of some of some of the artists work. So at the festival, we will have some live music, which will be a really exciting way to showcase local and regional artists as well. We'll open up a call for vendors, for arts, tech, and culture related vendors. We're going to throw a pretty killer after party to showcase the nightlife that Springfield has to offer. And we're also going to have some micro events to showcase some other local artists and, um, and crafters and, and what they bring to the table. And in addition to making this a really exciting new experience for Springfield residents, for the community and surrounding areas. Really what this does is to tie back to the, the long-term goal is it starts to really thread the needle um, through some of those holes that we had noticed, right? So um, how can we not just bring art here? How can we do it in a way that involves the community, that makes people proud and excited and engaged in doing it, right? So at the end of the festival, we'll have eight new super <laughs> Uh, big pieces up in downtown Springfield, right? So we're transforming our space. We're doing it in a really exciting way. Folks will get to watch them live, paint, see the process, uh, and then get to keep these really wonderful pieces of art from, from some really phenomenal artists. Um, and they feel like they're part of that process instead of one guy or gal saying, I think this art is great and I think it should go on this building, right? So it, it really wraps in that community involvement aspect and, and starts to really make sure we're focused on that community growth and diversity growth. So this is the, uh, the, the lineup for year one that we're pretty excited about. So uh, we just got little snippets. Uh, we're, we're providing our artists a um, a, a prompt of positivity and community, and so each artist will create a, a, a piece that re relates to that in their own way. So we're excited to bring uh, all these artists here to Springfield, kind of make sure that we're bolstering our local artists, but also giving a taste of Springfield to the outside artists, right? So we can start to connect to those ecosystems as well. So how can you dive in to the momentum? So we are, like I said, really focused on making sure that this is a community endeavor um, and that it's not an isolated uh, f funnel of curation, right? So to make sure that the community feels involved, we wanted to do a community funding uh, event. So we're kicking off a Kickstarter in March of next year, where we can, um, if you're interested in, in chipping in there, there's a really exciting way to get involved. You can, if you're a planner, you can join a committee uh, and, and help us uh, really build an awesome event, right, as on, the, uh, on, the, on the ground floor. So we have a few committees that you can reach out to. You can sign up to the newsletter, make sure that you are up to date on everything that we've got going on. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor for our event, you can do that as well. And of course, you can attend the festival. So uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, reach out, and, uh, and we'll hope to see you there.
Thanks, Meg. It wouldn't be 2020 if we didn't have one of our panelists via Zoom. So last but certainly not least, joining us virtually is Krista Perrier from the Geek Foundation. Hello, everyone. I Yes, I couldn't a appear in person this time, but I got to say what a dream it is to be here and sharing my dream with this event today. I'm really excited to be a part of this forum. So I am Krista. I'm the president and co-founder of the Geek Foundation. We are a local nonprofit whose mission is to offer education for the tech industry. So whether that is computer programming, IT, robotics, you know, different areas like that, um, we teach tech education courses. Um, so growing up, I, I grew up here in Springfield. I was born and raised here, and I was a, a young girl who was what you traditionally call a geek. So I loved comic books and video games, and I was a huge science nerd and a mathlete and all of the things that make you a geek. But I grew up in the 80s, so I did not have role models, you know, who would tell me, you know, maybe you should go into STEM fields, you know, for because of the things that I was interested in. So Throughout high school, um, I actually wound up taking through Spanish Five and thought I would become an international interpreter, but it just never quite stuck with me and I just couldn't figure out exactly what I wanted to do. So actually in 2009, I had dated a guy who was a computer programmer. And um, I remember him, you know, doing his work sometimes and looking at the computer programming languages he was doing, and it just made sense to me. I've kind of always equated learning a computer programming language to something like learning a foreign language. So um, it just made sense to me. And I remember from there, I sat out on a mission to try to figure out, like, how do I become a computer programmer? I knew a lot of people in the field and, um, you know, tried to do a lot of research to figure out, you know, how to get into the field and what the best way to go about it was. And, you know, unfortunately for me, from my experience, you know, I kept getting hit with a lot of what you would hear as, you know, a gatekeeper mentality. You know, it was too hard or if you hadn't been doing it your whole life or, you know, yada, 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 and so on and so on. And I just kept thinking, that doesn't sound right. You know, it, it didn't sound right to me that I should have to be a tinkerer, you know, my whole life or have been, you know, into the, interested in, in my whole life. So I started studying the industry a lot and seeing that there was jobs available for computer programmers, for IT people, you know, whether that was web development or um, engineers or software developers or whatever across the entire globe, there was just consistently jobs hiring for it all of the time. So in 2011 and 2012, I watched organizations like Girls Who Code and Women Who Code pop up. And I was so motivated by what they were doing and had spent this entire time like studying the tech industry and realizing globally, we actually have a really large tech industry here. So, um, you know, I started setting out with a mission to change the question from how do I get involved to would you hire on people who don't have a traditional four-year degree if they could um, prove themselves, you know, that they could, they could do the work. And the, the dynamic shifted a lot. And it was pretty incredible to watch people say, yes, you know, um, actually, if they could pass our technical interviews, we would be happy to take them on and to, um, you know, we, we, we would take them without a traditional four-year degree. So that, that, shifted the conversation into, you know, what I started equating um, computer programming and IT as, you know, being sort of like skilled trades, you know, and during that time, uh, a lot of boot camps started popping up online, you know, to learn full stack web development or front end web development or cloud computing and things, but they were still charging, you know, upwards of $15,000, you know, and they would do um, deferred tuition, but as soon as you got your first job, then you were paying back, you know, all that money. And I kept thinking, you know, I've always had motivation to do nonprofit work as well and to try to help people and to give pe people a means of, you know, trying to get out of poverty. But I kept thinking, how can you get out of poverty if you can't afford to get out of poverty? So I started asking around, you know, would the tech industry here be supportive of a school that could teach 
educational courses, you know, and get people into these high paying jobs. And all, everybody was very responsive and was very supportive of it. And one night while talking to, you know, a, a fellow um, worker here, he, he mentioned that I should meet a coworker of his um, because he thought she would support my mission and, and would do great with me. And he introduced me to my co-founder, uh, Miranda Progrance, who works for Mostly Serious. She is a director of engineering. And when we met up the first night, she told me about her experience was that she had gone through college and was the only girl in her senior class until or until her senior class actually. So we immediately hit it off and within the week had started the Geek Foundation and that was five years ago now. So uh, for the last four years, we've been doing children's programming through you know, resources like the libraries and the boys and girls clubs. And you know, we absolutely loved you know, getting to do the work that we were doing in the community but had always wanted to move into adult education as well. And specifically our mission is to try to increase diversity in the tech industry because, you know, for IT, for example, um, only 7% of IT A plus certification holders are women. And, um, you know, in 1995, 37% of computer scientists were women, but that's decreased to 24% now. And that's not even including, you know, the diversity of, you know, people of color and other underrepresented populations in the tech industry. So we kind of set out on the mission to be able to offer classes for free so that everyone would have an opportunity. And this past year, we applied for our first grant and we did it in partnership with the Drew Lewis Foundation here at the Fairbanks where we were housed and with Pitt Technology Group. And we won our first grant to be able to put on uh, two classes for our first classes for AT, I, IT certification and for web development. And we had incredible turnout. We've actually been so blessed with what has happened. Um, our web development class was all women and one guy. And our IT class has been half um, women and half male. And our classes are getting ready to graduate for the first time next Tuesday, actually. So it's been an incredible year. And then through that, we were able to um, partner with the Missouri Job Center just a couple months ago. And they were um, partnered with us to start two more classes that just started a couple weeks ago. So we've been able to enroll a lot more people um, through the O'Reilly Center for Hope and through the Fairbanks here by partnering with nonprofits. So we partner with nonprofits like the Drew Lewis Foundation, like Single Moms Rock, like Minorities in Business and others to try to recruit our students so that we can make sure that we're trying to give everyone an equal opportunity for accessible education. And these jobs are just so high value because, and so, so valuable because they're so high paying. Um, a great example I love to give is a guy who um, started, he put his uh, salary on Twitter and he's retired and is younger than me and has started off at 50,000 um, as a computer programmer as a web developer and then taught himself different languages over 10 years and became a cloud computer and got a job working for Amazon Web Services, AWS and retired making half a million dollars a year. So. So I tell people often that the tech industry is valuable because it's not only workforce development, it's not only economic development because the jobs are high paying and oftentimes allow for remote work as well, um, but they're also personal development because they give you the opportunity to continue to learn and grow and make more money and be more valuable and just continuously learn forever. So the tech industry here is incredible because we don't really think that we have a tech industry because we have companies like O'Reilly Automotive, which we don't think of as tech and Jack Henry and all those and, and Expedia, Bass Pro, but most of these companies have very large tech departments and they just can't hire on enough people fast enough. So the Geek Foundation exists to try to give people the education that they need so that they can go into these jobs within the tech industry as every company essentially is a tech company at this point. And while, you know, uh, tech is already here, that's our future as well. And things will continue to shift, you know, and change and we'll have more technologies developing. But if we can help people get into these careers, we can, you know, change the shape of our future.
So thank you for having me here today. Krista, thanks so much, and thanks to all of our sponsors um, for being awesome Springfieldians, for inspiring us, um, because we all know that we can make the life we want right here in Springfield. Let's give one more round of applause for our panelists. I'd like to ask my co-host my co here, Jessica, to come back out on stage and introduce our next session. But while she does that, uh, those of you here in person and many of our sponsors have previously had delivered some awesome swag bags um, with a lot of uh, great goodies to, to take home and, and spread around our community. Those swag bags are sponsored um, by two great sponsors, Inner Circle Vodka Bar and Strategic Financial Concepts. So let's give them a round of applause. And as we get ready for our next session, I'd like to direct your attention right back to the screen. <laughs> 